good day. I'm Dean Jones, President and CEO of Realogic Sotheby's International Realty, and this is Market Perspectives, episode 001 with you, Tadashi. Oh. I'm so excited to have you. I got to say that we've been uh, actually talking about this for years, and uh, for this to come into fruition, I'm very excited to be here with you. Well, let's share who you are in addition to being a fashion icon <laughs> and a cold plunger. Tell us a little bit about who Tadashi Shiga is. Well, uh, luckily, I've been uh, born and raised in Seattle. Yeah. A long uh, family roots here, yep. three generations. Um, I went to Cleveland High School, U University of Washington, where we're actually at right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I've been in real estate all my life, basically, all my adult life from 19 years old. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to be talking about House Bill 1110 and the – great need for attainably priced homes, both for rent and for sale within the state of Washington and specifically within Puget Sound. And you've become a, a bit of an expert on this topic. How did you become so fascinated with this house bill and this whole topic of the missing middle? Well, throughout my career of real estate, I've been selling uh, development sites for developers in Seattle. And as time progressed, you can see that's so difficult to build homes in Seattle uh, and the surrounding areas yep. affordably. And then how can we add more density? Right. Uh, we're in this area where there's such lack of housing. And one of the main issues is that 75% of our zoning is for single family. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about a high density district. I mean, think of a city, let's take New York City, you yeah. know, Manhattan Island. Yeah. It is a two mile by 10 mile piece of real estate, and it's all high density. Would you agree with that? Oh, 100%. If we were to take Manhattan Island and place it over the Puget Sound area, let's just say fit that between Seattle and Bellevue, it's roughly I-90 to 405, up to 520, back to Seattle, down Elliott Bay. That's about two miles by 10 miles. If you think about it, the only areas that are truly high density in that area is downtown Bellevue in the Spring yep. District and also downtown and Seattle, Seattle and South Lake Union. There is a lot of single family zoning in that area. There and way too much, way too much yeah. single family zoning. And so that's kind of a, a way to enter into this House Bill 1110 is effectively the state legislator, uh, they are saying, let's go ahead and add infill multifamily type property inside of a single family zoning. Is that a good way of explaining what House Bill 1110 is? Yes, it is, and uh, why it's so, um, such a big generational up zone and truly inspiring is because both parties, bipartisans, mm -hmm. passed this. Mm -hmm. And what it is is it's trying to get rid of, of single family zoning. Well, looking at it a different way. Sure. Uh, adding, if you're a, a city that's 75,000 population more, Mm -hmm. which is like Seattle and Bellevue and Everett and Tacoma and whatnot, you'll be able to add, instead of just one house, you can do up to four houses. And if it's a quarter mile from a, a mass transit, you can do up to six. That's, that's a lot of opportunities to really provide the missing middle right. in housing and make it more attainable for all of us. Well, let's try to describe what the missing middle is. Um, you know, what what is what does that mean to you in terms of a product type and a price point? So, the missing middle to me is is something that's affordable. Mm -hmm. Currently, right now, uh, normally people will start out with maybe a condo, right? Uh, but why that's missing now uh, is because of the legalities of being sued of, of the condos and people aren't building them correctly right. right now. Yep. So that entry point is gone. Um, having something that's affordable, because when uh, before uh, an average person that's graduated like a, a nurse or a professor, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Would be able to um, buy a house that is maybe a couple times their annual income. Sure. But now it is seven, eight times uh, yeah. their annual income, and that's not really affordable anymore. Right. So we're going to have to identify smaller footprint housing formats that are going to be more attainably priced and hopefully in a walkable neighborhood close to conveniences that you need for work, 
and play and residential services, et cetera. And you know, that overlays into the Sound Transit 3 conversation, which is a multi-billion dollar transportation package. I believe it's about 116 miles of additional track line uh, throughout Puget Sound. And that's, that's kind of a game changer too, right? Because that's one of the other arguments people have is, well, let's just commute to the location where we can find affordability. And I would guess that Sound Transit 3 eventually is going to, through light rail, allow us to access more affordable neighborhoods. But is that in fact the case? Do you think it is going to solve the problem for more attainable housing? It's going to be a definitely a, a solution, but not we will not solve everything. But I'm right. very excited about that solution because uh, Following the light rail is one of the ways that many of my developers have been trying to target because you you want to have you want to build communities within sure. our communities you want to have something that's walkable through the light rail with through all the restaurants and the shops and like when I used to go to Japan uh, is everything's designed around the, the the light rail and the train stations right the closer you are to the train station the more valuable it is and unlike Seattle. Uh, in in Japan, most of the major cities, it is almost mid-rise everywhere instead of single-family zoning. That's right. Yeah, and that's one way to get a higher you know population base into a smaller geographic footprint. We got a lot of hills and a lot of waterways, and you know we can only build so much. We've got growth management, which is uh, specifically in King County, and it limits where we can have any sort of urban sprawl, right? And so that's another challenge that we have is this is effectively an up zone, meaning that you used to be able to build this type of structure, but now you can build this type of structure is increasing the density for these neighborhoods. And I guess it's pretty unique that this is a, this is a statewide initiative, right? This is a statewide initiative, yes. And that's why it's so exciting because every city is going to get an up zone and they have till July uh, July of 2025 to actually implement it. So in Seattle, wow, we really need this. Yeah. And it's going to provide also different housing types that we're, I'm very excited about too. We've been talking about the silver tsunami yep. for a long time, mm-hmm. all right? And uh, I'm turning 55 uh, this year, and actually I'm feeling like I'm actually thinking about what's my next chapter and what happens when you know we get older and I'm taking care of my, my mother right now, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it's important to provide age in place units. Right. You know, People want to stay uh, in their same house or community. Right. And this will give them more uh, options to actually do that. So not only age in place, but stay in place. So let's talk about what a typical single family home on a lot would look like after you apply this up zone, okay? Yes. Uh, and now before we get into that conversation, let's describe what is an ADU and a DADU, just for those, our audience members sure. that may not know what that stands for. Sure, an ADU is an attached unit, attach, attached uh, dwelling unit. Okay. And a which is like a a, a mini townhome next to your house or below your house, like the mother-in-law unit that could be an attached ADU. Then there's the detached uh, 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 dad you mm-hmm. or like. But my wife is always like, "But what about the mom do?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, dad do a lot all all year long, not just on Father's Day. Um, but let me ask you. So uh, these are either attached dwelling unit, so it's a separate door access, you've got a kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, and think of it as a small apartment that's attached to an existing single family home that yes. most people would understand what that looks like. And that's not really an uncommon situation. There's a lot of uh, mother-in-law type yes. suites, but it could be uh, leased or sold potentially to a third party. Yes, and that's uh, that's something that say, the city of Seattle and Kirkland has just implemented with the, many of our builders are very excited about that you can actually sell it mm-hmm. or rent it or lease it and that adds more density uh, uh, one of the issues uh, lately is that there's a lot th- because of MHA mm-hmm. and all the, the difficulties of building in Seattle and the cost wise uh, there is a big decrease in townhomes mm-hmm. a 70 percent well, decrease. Well, describe what MHA is. Oh, MHA is Master uh, Mandatory Housing Affordability Act. And so, what happens to a developer when they have the MHA applied to their development? Well, uh, in a lot of cases, since everything is getting more expensive, yep. uh, it's it's basically a tax that 
uh, makes it so that my, many builders have decided not to do that. Yep. Because it's it makes it so that it's unprofitable. Yep. Well, I mean, it adds cost to the developer, which at the end of the day gets passed along to the consumer. And if it the market hasn't met the cost of construction, you know, plus financing and a reasonable profit, the developer just simply won't go forward. Yeah. And, and that's effectively where we're at right now in the infill condominium market. You know, we haven't had a groundbreaking of a large condominium project in the city of Seattle since 2020. And that's uh, that's really a shame because that is the missing middle. I think condominiums are going to make a very large comeback, and we're already starting to see that uh, with the existing inventory that we have. But to put it in perspective, uh, more than two-thirds of the available inventory that was under construction or soon to be delivered has already found buyers in this current cycle. Wow, that's great. And the challenge we have is what you see is what you get for inventory. So if you're looking to uh, a condominium as being a more affordable product type and price point, you know, we can get into a, a studio for below $500,000 or an urban one-bedroom you know, maybe 600,000, maybe a natural one bedroom um, from the 700,000s and, and possibly a two bedroom, you know, in the low 900,000s. I mean, typically around $1,000 a square foot mm -hmm. is where you're seeing a lot of transactions happening right now. But that is far below the replacement cost of that product type. And that's the challenge. I mean, like if you were to uh, build a new building now, what that's would right. you think the be? Uh, that replacement cost. We are consulting on some and you know if you can't pencil about $1,500 a square foot in pre-sale uh, it's not going to pencil to go forward yeah. and so really where we have to go from the resale market and the existing new construction uh, product lines that we have inventory you know we have to see about a 30 to 50 percent increase in market values before a lot of these other projects are going to pencil. And I'm speaking in generalities, right? Yeah. I mean, these are not, obviously, we've got entry-level product and we've got super prime luxury products that are going to be at a higher price per square foot. But on average, that's the math. And so you can see what is going to happen to the existing supply is as it gets absorbed and it appreciates, it's going to eventually get to a place where it pencils to build new construction again. I will also say there's a lot of construction happening. It's just for rent. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, our audience may not realize that, you know, the city of Seattle has been the fastest growing large city in the United States for the last decade. Uh, between 2010 and 2020, okay, 10 year span, we have seen unbelievable growth. Thir uh, nearly 30,000 multifamily housing units were built within walking distance of each other. Put that in perspective, okay? But 93% of that was purpose built for rent and not for sale. So that's great investments for the landlord, but it's not exactly meeting our target for no, attainable it's no, it's not. for ownership, is it? No, it's not. And and that's that's the that's the problem. And Washington State right now, uh, they project in the next 20 years that we need 1.1 million homes. Yep. Uh, that would mean we need to build about 55,000 homes a year. Uh, on the average of the last 10 years, it's been, we're only producing about 35,000 uh, homes. Well. So there is a really big deficit there that we need to overcome. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's simple supply and demand, right? So yeah. if we have uh, more demand than the supply, the prices are going to go higher, and that means higher rents or, you know, higher strike price for purchases. Um, and, you know, so comparing the multifamily unit, say an apartment mm -hmm. or a townhome to a single family, I mean, what would you say a single family home would cost in the city of Seattle right now? I mean, on the entry level, where, what, what's a neighborhood and a price point you think might be possible to find a single family home? Well, single family homes across uh, Seattle are just, they're expensive everywhere. Yeah. That's, that's really the issue, whether yeah. it's Beacon Hill or the central area where um, I, we had three generations there, my family, um, you know, a, a house that, uh, my family purchased in uh, 82, mm -hmm. uh, a Craftsman that uh, was 3,000 square feet, mm -hmm. which actually I live in right now, uh, was purchased for $22,000. Wow. And what would a home like that trade now, for today? Now it's 1.2. Yeah. Well, and so much of that uh, infill housing that you were very active in a townhome. So yeah. let's let's go and talk about a townhome product yeah. line for yeah. a second. So that requires a certain type of zoning in some neighborhoods. What where yes. would be an example of that? Uh, normally, the zoning is uh, the low rise zones, the L one, two, and three. Okay. Yes. And so, what is a you know feasible townhome project of yesteryear? Just to give us a perspective, how many units would it be? Oh yeah, normally the sweet spot would be around four to six units. Okay. And there are the unit sizes actually got the, 
they were bigger and then we got it down to even like below a thousand square feet for a three-story unit which is pretty narrow wow but they but the builders are trying to meet a price point uh to make more attainability uh for the different neighborhoods in seattle you know i mean that brings to a topic which is people can afford to live in less space they just simply can't afford to pay more than they can afford that's 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 100 percent true and i think yeah. you know to proof of concept there i just go try and slip into one of those new york boutique hotels i mean they're like 350 square feet oh, yeah, i mean yeah. there's not even yeah. room for your bag let alone you know a pillow for your head but um but they make it work because yeah. you know they realize that the amenities aren't what's within the room the amenities are everything out that front door right down the elevator um and so that's a little bit of what high density housing is about now okay. it what's different is you know in, in new york stay might only be for a weekend but you're trying to make a life right in, sure. in your studio apartment or condominium or very slim townhome it sounds yeah. like but that is really the only answer is to live in less space so it costs less yes and that's why uh the having the building the adus and the dadus now uh is a really good option uh because it is less space they're about thousand square feet in seattle for mm -hmm. the dadus and uh, they're going for around 650. okay mm -hmm. uh how many of those do you think have been built since we were allowed zoning wise in Seattle to build ADUs and DADUs. Yeah, there's been about 3,000. I mean, 3, that's 000. not an awful lot. No. So that's something to remember that even though um, uh, we have legislation that says all municipalities must conform to this yes. new uh, HB 1110 by next summer, effectively, okay? I mean, I wonder how many new housing units are going to be built. I hope a lot, but uh, I know there is a lot of people or who are very scared about having all these things popping up everywhere. And they, and they think that it might ruin the, uh, the feeling of the community mm -hmm. that it has. But uh, I, I don't think it's gonna be everywhere. But uh, I wish it was, actually. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this in Vancouver, BC, where my hometown was, and there's a lot of, I think, growth policies that have been mirrored in the Seattle area, looking at Vancouver, either from tall and slender tower zoning or tower spacing. You know, these were some models that we've realized uh, back in um, uh, Mayor Nichols' days in 2006. There was the up zone in downtown Seattle that allowed for taller, more slender towers because the, the shorter, fatter towers didn't always pencil as much, right? Yes. And they also required more dirt. Um, and so if you couldn't assemble enough land to get the squat uh, base of a, a podium tower, then, you know, you weren't going to go vertical. And then once they imposed the more slender tower, now with technology, we are seeing, yes. you know, an up zone in downtown Seattle. And of course, that was part of the fertilizer that allowed that fresh crop of new housing, uh, both for rent and for sale. And it was really meteoric since yeah. Um, about 15 years of development with that policy being put in place. But, you know, a single tower or a twin tower project could easily deliver 500 or 700 yeah. units. And that gets us a pretty long way towards some of our goals in those appropriate zoned areas, back to our earlier point. Yes. Um, so it's going to take a whole bunch of individual decision making to add 3,000 units in the backyards of neighborhoods you know. Oh, oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, we just actually, uh, 2023 was a record year of units being delivered in Seattle. There were about uh, 12,800 units uh, develop, uh, delivered in, in Seattle, there, mm -hmm. which was a 20-year high, Yep, which is incredible. But that was because we had 20,000 permits in 2020. Right now, this this year, it's going to be 6,000. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty catastrophic slowdown in terms of new construction building for those types of larger projects. Um, of that number of units that were delivered in 2023, what percentage of those do you believe were rental? Oh. I think I'm a, like half, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah, I and mean, we do know from an yeah. infill perspective, there were no new condominiums oh, yeah. you know, that were uh, broken ground mm -hmm. of recent so we've we represent three of the projects that have broken ground many years ago and are delivering in 2022 mm -hmm. 2023 and 2024 there are no new condominium projects delivering in 25 or 26 because they haven't broken ground since 2020 oh, yeah. and you know the challenge there is demand can rise much quicker than supply when you're talking oh. about a high-rise oh and for sure when you look at only 6,000 permits uh, this year yeah so that means in Two years from now, in 25 and 26, 
there's going to be a super low supply coming onto the marketplace. Like with currently, when we had twelve thousand eight hundred homes mm -hmm. last year, and, and the marketplace yep. has settled down now. It yes. looks like we've reached uh, so far. Knock on wood, uh, you know the uh, the hopefully bottom price point. Right. That's my belief. Yeah, I don't I don't see prices regressing. I think we have already experienced that. Um, uh, discount if you will over the last couple of years especially in city because you know the downtown seattle market uh has had a tougher time through covid than yeah. some of the outlying areas i think everyone understands that both politically mm -hmm. and um and uh you know the whole work from home dynamic yeah. has certainly challenged commercial office buildings and there's been you know far less consumer base now going into the city so restaurants have closed and some of the residential services have closed and you know for many years there we were seeing more drywall um, come down yeah. and, and boards go up on windows than we were you know seeing new construction of retail but that has turned around so yes. I'm happy to report and I know the downtown Seattle Association has done a great job at you know leading our, our, our recovery it yes. truly is in a residential renaissance and some of those larger employers um, Amazon famously is saying please come back to we work yeah I want to see you three it, days a week. We need to have a vibrant downtown. That's it's, what it takes. It's so it's so important. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it breaks my heart when I uh, see what happened to our city for a while. We, uh, you know, I think we lost our luster. You know, the the Emerald City I had know. a few facets knocked out of us. Um, but we are making a comeback. You know, um, we were both attending an event with Matthew Gardner, the Economist, yes. uh, yesterday. He's fabulous. And he is fabulous. And he just said flat out, he says, "Don't bet against Seattle." You never bet against Seattle. No, we've no. got uh, a lot of that housing is built, um, and a lot of that commercial property is built. And even though there is a very high percentage of sublet space and um, open vacancy for office use, um, they will find tenants. Um, just like oh, yeah. a great restaurant is not going to go long without a chef. Oh, yeah. So we will find maybe um, a renewal of that demand, and that's going to bring with it housing demand as well. So Oh, for sure. Uh, Warren Buffett said the, the buildings will stay, the owners will change. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> well, and that, that creates an opportunity. So, I mean, you want to buy the dip. Yes. Um, and if you were you know looking at making an investment in a high-density market like downtown Seattle, I would, I would tell you right now um, there is fantastic – opportunities in infill condominiums that are being sold well below replacement costs and it could be many years before we see peer like product come out of the ground and when they do it's going to be at 30 to 50 percent higher prices because that's what the developer will need to pencil the project oh for sure i, I can just see it. it's an amazing time to buy a condo right now in downtown seattle for sure because this is the the bottom and I think there's really blue skies ahead of us right now. Well, let's take that little Jenga piece out of the tower. And so we're talking about uh, a dadu, for instance. Yeah. So walk me through what a dadu would look like in your backyard. How much real oh, estate yeah. do you need? And just kind of paint the picture for the audience on yeah. what this looks like. Yeah, sure. Uh, we found out uh, when we did some studies, there's about 50,000 lots out there that you could probably put a dadu in the backyard. Uh, and you probably need around uh, the city allows you to have a, a thousand square foot uh, dad do which is which is normally on two stories right now okay and so that's about a 500 square foot footprint yeah and it's it's an incredible way to uh, maybe rent it out have income okay or or also or you could sell it or you know a lot of people are having their kids move back okay or staying for longer terms and they could uh, it's another option for them or also people who want to downsize, right? They don't want their McMansion anymore, but they still want to stay in the neighborhood. Uh, they, a lot of people are building one for, for themselves. I mean, I could totally see that, which is, you know, we're gonna harvest the equity out of our single family home. Let's go ahead and build a dadu on the property and then downsize on our own lot. Yeah. Certainly saves on the moving cost, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, and you basically uh, retire there and, and maybe with your excess equity buy a second home in you know another sunshine destination oh. perhaps and you know you i could yeah. actually see that lifestyle making sense for a lot of folks oh oh for sure and with the house bill uh, 1110 uh better option is because instead of being limited to to a thousand square feet hey a thousand square feet is actually pretty sort of small mm -hmm. uh you can it'll it will increase the size and options of what you can do on your piece of property so you can uh, build it so that maybe it's a two thousand square foot you know, and have actually an age in place where you have you know, all living on one floor, the main floor, yep. 
Uh, so you have your mas- uh you have your uh, not the master <laughs> anymore. Is it your primary? <laughs> your primary. <laughs> yes. And uh, the, also the caretaking upstairs. Sure. Yeah. So is it fair to say, and we have yet to see what the guidelines and zoning bylaws look like, right, for setbacks and density. I mean, you know, all these municipalities have to meet the standard of House Bill 1110 yeah. uh, by the end of this year, and those permits need to be pullable by the summer of 2025. Of 25. Okay. Yes. So I would imagine there's a whole bunch of, you know, uh, architects and um, city planners mm-hmm. and a lot of whiteboards in the war room uh, trying to figure out what those setbacks are going to look like what are yes. those guidelines has any municipality published yet what they are going i'm to not i'm not aware of right okay. now. yes and they're not due until the end of the yeah. year it sounds like and you're going to want to get that right they um, have to because get right. you know you don't want to ruin backyards and i mean what are they going to be doing like with parking requirements yeah, that's a that's a good question um i'm actually not sure if they determine that it for each one of the jurisdictions they're uh they're trying to figure that out right now I and I'm also, I'm also hoping that um, one of the things that we look at for development is uh, impact fees. Are they going to are they going to increase? How can they stop this? You know, are they going to add more impact fees or to make it more expensive so uh, pe- it's not actually a possible to do it? Um, I'm just hoping that the uh, each jurisdiction uh, makes it so that it's easier to build and not. Well, that is it. that is a challenge, right? Because you know when you allow a new land use yeah. it will must be very tempting to say well here let's increase our tax base yeah. you know or mha back yeah. to that discussion yeah. so yeah. if they uh take too big of a bite out of that apple i mean you may find that development won't occur because That's if you create too much <laughs> red tape oh, and it's sure. a pain in the butt and sure. it's expensive then at some point you might have the zoning but you have no takers oh for sure you know i think it's they'll if they do it correctly Instead of pick, making a whole bunch of impact fees in the very in the front end, uh, just they'll they'll collect more uh, taxes by the increasing the value of that property. When instead of having one house there, you know, uh, maybe a, normally it's gonna, probably going to be like a teardown. Yeah, it's going to be turned into a four to six units. It'll go from uh, that that small like maybe uh, eight hundred thousand dollar tax base mm-hmm. to when you newly build it, it's going to be four million. I mean, and let's talk about that because you just described a teardown. Um, and conventionally right now, one of the reasons why housing is so expensive in the Seattle area is there are very few teardowns. It seems like there's a lot of added value homes, even if it's a 100-year-old home like the one you were describing. Over the years, they've been improved. New roof, upgraded kitchen, you know, adding the uh, the accoutrement, if you will, to making it a modern-day you know, uh, modern home. Um, so it the land value will have to become so much greater than the improved value of the home in order for it to be torn down. Would oh, you agree? For sure, for sure. If it's so like in Queen Anne Hill or uh, in, the, in the nice areas, if, it, if you have a really beautiful house there, it's not gonna be torn down. The land value is not, it's that value of that house is worth more than the land and tearing it down. Yeah, so I think the idea of neighborhoods being obliterated by you know this new House Bill 1110 is just very unlikely. Very unlikely. Unless that is a neighborhood that has you know very aged homes yeah. uh, with large lots mm-hmm. near a light rail station yes. and the land value does exceed that of the improvement value. Um, you could see developers going on a buying spree in those neighborhoods. For sure. It's an incredible opportunity. And my developers are all excited about it. Like, let me paint a picture. So um, you're familiar with Vancouver, B.C. Oh, yeah. And the arterials of, say, Camby Street or Oak Street or Granville Street yeah. are all main thoroughfares, non-freeway, but they're thoroughfares with stoplights that take you from, you know, the, uh, the Fraser River into downtown Vancouver. Um, every one of those main streets now have been upzoned. They were all largely single-family homes or they were duplexes. And uh, then if you drive there today, you will see that there is a couple things happening. First of all, all of those single family homes and duplexes have been upzoned. And so there's been land assembly where developers, uh, well, first real estate agents are saying, hey, development opportunity, come buy this and go vertical with your 45 foot, you know, stacked 
uh, condominium or townhome development, um, which is a massive change in the zoning, but also massive change in the way housing is being developed. Yeah, because how much were those single family homes there that were before? And then when they added that density, how much were the, uh, I'm sure it added more affordability. Oh, I mean, let's just say that they doubled in value yeah. because the land potential was so much greater. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It was literally adding fertilizer mm -hmm. to the earth and boom, up comes a crop of you know townhomes and condominiums and, and apartments. Um, but it's completely changed the experience yeah. of driving into downtown Vancouver. Um, and it needed to happen because they have an affordability crisis in yeah. Vancouver as well. And so I'm just saying that's a little bit of what we could see with sort of zoning, but that's not what House Bill 1110 is. No. Um, because they're not taking, you know, um, high traffic areas and up zoning um, on the streets. They're yeah. saying, let's go into single family neighborhoods and sprinkle in higher density products such as ADUs and DADUs. Yes. And fourplexes and triplexes. And uh, but if it is next to a uh, well quarter mile to mass transit, s six units, that's that's pretty good density. So a six unit application mm -hmm. would likely require the removal of the existing home. Yes, because it just with the setbacks and what would that look like? Would it be kind of a cluster of attached um, townhomes? Do you think or yes, would they be? Yes, look uh, for a six unit site. The most efficient way to probably build will be a townhome. Okay will look more like a town home. And we've seen a lot of that mm -hmm. in, say, central Seattle, yes. right? Juckins Park, and I'm yep. thinking of other Beacon neighborhoods. Beacon Hill, Ballard. And didn't you just Greenland. say earlier, though, that there was a pretty significant slowdown of townhome development in those neighborhoods? 70%. 70% slowdown. Reduction. Why? Um, perfect storm, really, when you have the economy, uh, you have the rising prices, the inflation, the building costs, the uh, times... Uh, it takes a permit, a project. Uh, the, uh, on top of that, the MHA fees. Yeah, it's it was a lot. So if all that zoning's in place and we've got ready, willing, and able developers, but they're still not moving forward, then what makes us think that the 1110 is going to somehow somehow get yeah. a crop of new housing well, if those MHA fees are great. still in place? Well, that's a great question. You know, like uh, what we've seen is that uh, they sh they actually allow the townhome builders shifted to building single family ADUs and DADUs. Hmm. So you're gonna see that, sh so they're gonna be much more of those buildings coming up right now. Uh, and so that's why I'm so bullish uh, and excited about the house bill because it, it, it is a big opportunity. It will, allow, it will add needed units and size units and different types. It will give, it will give uh, the buyers more options. Mm -hmm. that, that instead of just like, a thousand square foot unit. I think they can be more livable uh, around 13, 1500 square feet. Fantastic. And we've been working on a project together up in Clay Ellum uh, with Trailside Homes. <laughs> Super excited about let's that. Let's yeah. talk about Adara for a second because sure. that is the other yeah. way to reach the, meet, the, the missing middle. Oh, yeah. Um, so these are single family homes on boutique scaled lots yes. that are, how much the square footage? Maybe 1400? Yeah, 1400. To yeah, 2,500 square feet. So they're um, they're efficiently scaled single family homes. Yes, and also there's going to be some uh, townhome product uh, there too. And the price points? Uh, price points to be from hopefully like the high sixes mm -hmm. to the mid ones. So here's a perspective: if you're priced out of Seattle and you're priced out of yeah. King County, one answer is a 90 minute drive on I-90. Yeah. Uh, we'll take you to Clay Ellum, and there is a development there, Adara, that is meeting the missing middle um, with affordably priced, brand new construction homes on the side of a hill. Um, Living in an incredible playground. Uh, and Clay Ellum is just so charming now. We've been going up there now for about three years. Right. And to see the, the redevelopment of Clay Ellum and keeping its, its incredible charm there, uh, to be able to you know, live, this is a, one of the few uh, uh, projects out there that um, maybe it's the only one where you can live in the mountain and walk the town. Yeah. 
and that's going through uh, a ton of change now you yeah. know with farm yeah. to table restaurants and residential services and you know all the the sort of uh it still has its you know 100 plus year heritage but has been upgraded if you will because yeah. there's demand there's a lot of folks now that that's how they're choosing to live and work differently they're yeah. doing the hybrid work schedule yes when you do the hybrid work schedule that's 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 huge yeah uh, what about other markets? I mean, you're doing some investment down south in yes. Tacoma. Let's talk about what might be taking place there for attainably priced homes. Yeah, well, you know, I'm super excited about Tacoma. Thanks for bringing that up because, uh, I mean, I I'm a always will be uh, a Seattleite. Love Seattle. Seattle's my hometown. But as Seattle got more uh, unaffordable, um, I was looking at other areas um, which maybe have some more attainability. Right. And then uh, I, I used to never go to Tacoma. I remember as a kid growing up in Seattle, it was always the Roma of Tacoma and whatnot. But uh, things have really changed. I, I, w I spent a lot of time down there, and I got to really see uh, what an amazing uh, community that they have, incredible buildings. Uh, the, the, art, the art community and what's happening down there is uh, quite astounding, especially what they've done with uh, Rustin Way. Oh, yes. So yeah, I purchased an office building during the pandemic. Uh, you could ask me 10 years if that was a smart move. But uh, we're looking at uh, developing the first, uh, Tacoma's first uh, sustainability collaborative uh, in Tacoma. So we can really help build beautiful, sustainable, and attainable homes in Pierce County. And my goal is, is throughout each one of the different counties of King County, Stomach County too. I mean, I agree with you 100% just because we've seen cities evolve and Tacoma has the infrastructure it's got accessible waterfront it's got light rail it's equidistant to you know the airport which is why they call it SeaTac International yeah. Airport yeah. Um, so you know it has all the right stuff and so here we have an opportunity to see a higher volume of development take place in in apartments condominiums and townhomes because the zoning is there the zoning is there in fact uh, uh, Tacoma's uh, pretty progressive on their zoning uh, they they were so, sort of a step ahead of the House Bill 1110. Uh, they wanted to also get rid of their single family zoning too, and it's it's really exciting being part of a city that's reimagining what it can be, and uh, we're going to take it to the next level, bring affordability but also vibrancy to that part that to Tacoma. Well, and I got to ask a closing question now about your vibrancy. So talk to me about this cold plunge. <laughs> <laughs> well, me, uh, turning 55 years old, I was, uh, you know, hacking my health is really always uh, top of my mind uh, for sure. And uh, I got introduced to cold plunging about three years ago. One of my good friends was like, hey, Kanashi, when it was a snowy day in the winter in Seattle, I was, he was like, you want to go jump into Lake Washington? <laughs> and I was like, uh, that was my year of yes, where wherever anybody said something to me, I'd ask me something to do, I'd go, Yes. Let's do so it. So I was like, hey, let's jump into uh, Lake Washington. Um, he jumped in. I jumped in. I'm not sure if that was the most smartest thing to do Yeah. Uh, when there was snow uh, on the ground, but it felt incredible. And then I started researching this guy named Wim Hof, who has the world record of of cold plunging. And I, I started to do, I think I've done more cold plunging than anybody I've heard of. I've I've now done probably about 3,000 cold plunges, wow. which is 38 degrees. I start my day with a sauna and then go into 38 degree water. And you have your home in, in Seattle and then also a home on Vashon. Yes, I have a, I'm fortunate to have a, a beach run house on Vashon and that's where I do my cold plunging in the Puget Sound. So uh, I do my polar plunge every day well, it's looking good on you. I, I feel like I've done my, my polar plunge every day, but it's in the housing market, which has been very chilly for the last couple of years. Um, so now that things are warming up, maybe I'll have to uh, try a, a, an ice bath. You, you got you to gotta come out and join yeah. me. And uh, yeah, the, the marketplace got a little chilly, uh, uh, but I know it's going to start, definitely it's going to start heating up. Well, we are seeing interest rates come down. We are seeing loan originations go up and housing demand is following, of course. We think it's going to be a very busy spring and, um, you know, truly the the supply and demand imbalance is going to be really felt uh, in 2024. This is the inflection point that we've yes. been waiting for for a couple of years. I think more normalized, you know, decision making. Um, I think the days of 3% mortgage interest rates are long in our past and not to be coming yeah. back again around. So um, I actually yeah. don't want them to come back. 
to three yeah. percent. I think it, a, a more moderate uh, interest rate, which it looks like all the experts are saying that are, uh, we're going to probably have the drops in interest rates in May or July or so. Yeah, they're already and, falling. Yeah, and when it comes down like that, and with a lack of supply, so guess what happens when you have lack of supply and more demand? Prices are going up. Prices are going up. Yeah, yeah, I think you know waiting to buy is only going to represent less selection and higher prices. So. You know, we'll see whether House Bill 1110 is going to be the solution that we need for the region's attainable uh, crisis in housing. And, you know, I, I think it's going to take us a couple of years to sort of see that benefit. So like everything, you know, it, it, only time will tell. Yes, but it's a really exciting time to be uh, part of Seattle and uh, especially part of uh, Real Logic Southern Reason Ash Realty. And uh, yeah. Well, thanks for being such a luminary thought leader for us, and we will continue to follow this trend and have you back on again. Thanks, Tadashi. Yeah, back at you, Jay. Always. Good to see you. Well, thanks to our audience for listening. Uh, you can certainly subscribe and have us deliver to you updates directly to your device. Uh, and we encourage you to leave a review and share with a friend. And as always, follow us on social media. So until next time, we'll see you on Market Perspectives. Have a great day.